This is a conversation with Massimo Pigliucci. He's an author, evolutionary scientist, stoic philosopher, and professor of philosophy at the City College of New York. He's the author of 16 books, including the best-selling How to Be a Stoic, Using Ancient Philosophy to Live a Modern Life. And he's one of the most prominent educators of stoicism out there today. In this conversation, we discuss the importance of philosophy. What is stoicism? How does it compare with Aristotelian Epicureanism philosophies? We talk about the advantages and disadvantages of stoicism, nature versus nurture, and free will. This is no time. If you like what you see, then do hit subscribe on YouTube, follow on Spotify, or rate 5 stars on Apple Podcasts. This project runs on your love and support. If you'd like to see it continue, do consider making a donation on Patreon, Anchor. You can subscribe on Instagram or leave a gift on Reels. If not through financial support, then do consider sharing these episodes, leaving your likes and comments. All forms of engagement, they really go a long way. For other forms of love and support, you can follow this channel on Instagram or Twitter or follow me personally. And now, it's no time. Socrates had once said that the unexamined life is not worth living. Today, philosophy, people often shy away from it. They shy away from examining their lives. They they shy away from asking these big questions. They view philosophy as abstract, not useful. People who try to bring up big philosophical questions and conversations are labeled pretentious or just trying to act smart. You've often mentioned that parents of your students try to discourage them from studying philosophy because they view it as not a, not a good use of time or not practical. Somehow, somewhere, asking these big philosophical questions, which used to be the most important questions at one point of time, they started to get these negative connotations. So let's start with trying to make a case for philosophy. And let's start with possibly a silly sounding question to you. Why is philosophy important? Uh, it's a good question. It's not silly at all. As you mentioned, uh, even some of my students ask that question, certainly their parents, uh, when they're told that uh, the student want to do philosophy. It's a good question. I think one good way to answer it is to say that philosophy is a little bit like science. A lot of science is theoretical. It has no practical application. It's very abstract. It's very difficult to do. And only a very small number of people do it. And then some science is practical. It has applications. It leads to technological advancements and so on and so forth. And we don't question the difference between the two. We are okay with, let's say, a fundamental physicist doing his own things, whatever they're doing in their laboratory. We, we don't necessarily know what they're doing, but they're doing something and we don't, we don't make fun of them. And then occasionally <laughs> we expect, you know, the, a new version of the iPhone to come out, for instance, or, or something <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah. It's kind of the same with philosophy, meaning that most academic philosophy is in fact abstract, difficult, and practiced by very few people, just like science. But then there is, and that's where people get surprised, there is an applied aspect to philosophy. Mostly it has to do with ethics and political philosophy. That is, a lot of our thinking about how to behave uh, toward other people, how to build a just society, how to run a democracy and all that sort of stuff, that comes from philosophy. That is philosophy. Yeah. Whether those ideas are directly the result of, of uh, philosophical research and scholarship, or they are more broad part of you know, the conversation, they still are philosophy. And so that's where if you are interested in building a good, just society, if you're interested in uh, becoming a better person and dealing with other people in a, in a more ethical fashion, then philosophy is very useful. It's really fascinating to me how like philosophy, like you mentioned, is ingrained in so many different fields like politics, science, education, morality, ethics. But because it's now become the foundation layer for it, many people often don't focus on that aspect. Now politics has just become its own thing, but they don't see that it actually all derives from philosophy. So that's a, that's a great point that you just raised up. You discovered the importance of philosophy in a very interesting manner. You were an evolutionary scientist until a midlife crisis made you turn towards philosophy. And when you were trying to, when you embarked on this journey to answer some of the big questions, you were presented with multiple parts of frameworks that you could take. The first was religion, but you had given up on religion after you read Bertrand Russell's Why I'm Not a Christian in high school. So that got eliminated. Yep. You then turned towards secular humanism. Couldn't find that useful. You couldn't culture relate to Buddhism as well. So you then turn towards Aristotle and virtue ethics. When that didn't work, you turn towards Epicureanism. When that didn't work, you stumble upon Stoicism. Right. On Stoic Week and Stoic On as well. Let's start by defining all these terms. And first, let's start by defining the topic of the hour. 
what is stoicism what its main principles stoicism is an ancient greco-roman philosophy that started in the fourth century bce it became very popular throughout the roman empire and the mediterranean world and later on it influences christianity a lot of the ideas that we actually attribute to christianity actually does do come from from stoicism for instance uh, the Christians practice seven virtues, and yeah. these are wisdom, courage, justice, temperance, faith, hope, and charity. The mm -hmm. first four that I mentioned actually comes from the Stoics, and uh, Thomas Aquinas put them together with the latter three and, and came up with, uh, with the seven standard uh, Christian virtues. Then uh, Stoicism went into a little bit of a uh, sort of eclipse uh, after the Enlightenment, pretty much. Uh, the 19th, 20th century, uh, people were interested in other things. The, the whole notion of practical philosophy was becoming to be weird. This has been, practical philosophy had been a thing from Socrates that you mentioned yeah. early in the beginning, all the way through the Renaissance included. But after the Enlightenment, that notion uh, sort of fell away. Uh, th there was uh, major advancements in science. So people were interested in, in other things and they kind of lost touch with the notion of practical philosophy until the 20th century, part, middle part of the 20th century. One of the first things that uh, triggered a renaissance for stoicism was the fact that cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a very uh, effective evidence-based type of psychotherapy, was actually started in the 1960s from a direct inspiration from the Stoics. So the very early CBT practitioners were inspired by Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, Epictetus, who were, were all major Stoic thinkers. Mm -hmm. That lent credibility, basically, to a new examination of Stoic philosophy, because, you know, wait, wait a minute, if, if modern science says that this thing actually works, and has, you know, there is data showing that this stuff actually works, <laughs> it does improve people's lives and so on, yeah. then maybe we should take a, a look. And then a number of people, you know, we were talking about the connection between scholarship and practical philosophy. Two scholars that are very likely not recognized by the general public were instrumental in the resurgence of Stoicism. One was Larry Baker, who died a few years ago and wrote a very difficult to read book, I have to say, called A New Stoicism. This was an academic book that was not meant for, as a, you know, for the general public. Nevertheless, it kind of reshaped the whole notion of Stoicism because... Larry in that book was asking the question, okay, so what would happen today if we take the idea, these ideas from 2000 years ago, two and a half millennia ago, and update them by including modern science, modern psychology, modern philosophy, what, what would be the result? Hence the title of the book, A New Stoicism. Yeah. Another uh, scholar, Pierre Hadot in France, published three books, the most important one of which uh, arguably is The Inner Citadel, which is a book about Marcus Aurelius and his meditations. And that book also is meant, was meant for a, not for a general public, for an academic audience. It's a little bit difficult to read. But those two inspired a new group of people, including philosophers interested in talking to the public, as well as cognitive behavioral therapists, to get together and start a very practical thing, which you just mentioned, Stoicon, which is an annual meeting of people interested in Stoicism, and Stoic Week, which is a um, possibility, a chance for the, for the public to actually try out living like a Stoic for about a week and see how, how it feels. So you can see here a direct connection, really, between the scholarship on the one hand, uh, which is read by very few people, but then it influences an intermediary group of people, and then this latter group kind of brings it out to the general public. Fantastic. Thank you for that uh, history and evolution of Stoicism, the new revival of it. Let's talk about some of its main principles. Can you expand on these three principles that I was able to gain out of about Stoicism? One, the idea that nature is fundamental and that human beings are social animals and capable of reason. And while we are defining those, can we also define what is the dichotomy of control and what a preferred indifference? Great. Yeah, basically those cover the, ba the, the, the very <laughs> basics of, of Stoicism. So, the Stoic motto is that we should live according to nature. But we need to be careful how to interpret that. Yeah. Because for, for one thing, they're not saying that everything that is natural is good. Gotcha. There are obviously counterexamples. Uh, poisonous mushrooms are natural, but you know, you don't want to eat them. They're, they're, not, they're not good for you. So then what are they saying? They're saying that, look, if we're talking about how to allow a being like a human to flourish, then you have to take seriously human nature. 
let me give you an example that has nothing to do with humans for, for a moment. Let's say that you invite me over uh, here for dinner and I bring you a bottle of wine. And also as a present, I bring you a cactus. Mm -hmm. Now you're responsible for the cactus. And if you don't know anything about cactus nature, that cactus is not going to have a good time. Yep. You might know that, oh, it's a plant, so it wants light and water, which is true. But it's not just a plant. It's a specific kind of plant. And it is in the nature of cactuses to want a lot of light, but little water. Yeah. If you don't know that and you make the mistake of watering them a lot, they're going to die. So the idea that the Stoics put forth is that the same, although a little bit more complicated, is true for human beings. If the question is, how do human beings flourish? flourish uh, how do we be uh, uh, we can be, become happy in a, in a human society, then the answer is, all right, well, what kind of beings are humans and what makes them flourish? Yeah. The answers that they come up with were the, the two that you mentioned. That is, well, human beings are highly social. It's true that there are other social animals out there, but our societies are far more complicated and convoluted than anything else. And we flourish only in a society. We can survive on our own, but we flourish only in a society. And second... The evolutionary weapon, as we will put it today, of humanity is reason. We don't have big muscles. We don't run fast. We don't fly. Uh, you know, we don't have big fangs. We do have reason. We can reason our way through our problems. So the stoic conclusion was that living according to nature for a human being, as opposed to, you know, a cactus, means to live by using reason and by being cooperative, pro-social with other human beings. And that is the goal of a stoic life, to cultivate reason not abstract reason, not the kind of reason that you, you find applied in, you know, theoretical science or theoretical philosophy, but practical reason. In fact, they had a word for it. Practical reason is a word that is used by, by the Stoics. And to do so in a pro-social cooperative fashion. So that's the first point. The second point is the dichotomy of control. It's a fundamental idea in Stoicism. Uh, one of the ancient Stoics, Epictetus, made it essentially the centerpiece of his, of his philosophy. However, the term dichotomy of control is modern. Epictetus never uses it. And it's a little bit misleading because if you put it in terms of dichotomy of control, basically the idea is that, certain, that you control certain things, you don't control other things, and you should focus your attention on the things you control and develop an, act, an attitude of equanimity toward the things that you don't control. Problem is, if you put it that way, people immediately start saying, and rightly so, but wait a minute, what about the things that I don't entirely control, they just, I just influence them. And then it gets very quickly into a mess. So I don't like the, the word dichotomy, or the phrase dichotomy of control. I prefer actually Epictetus' original phrase, which is the fundamental rule. He calls it a fundamental rule of life. And the fundamental rule of life is this, some things are up to us, meaning that we are responsible for those things, and other things are not up to us. And a good human life is the result of focusing where our agency is effective, so the things that are up to us, and developing an attitude of acceptance or equanimity toward the things that are not up to us. Now, the, question, the immediate question, of course, is, okay, and what exactly is up to us and what is not up to us? And Epictetus' response was really interesting and once you grasp it, it's really powerful and very, very useful, I think. The basic idea is that, look, at the end of the day, that it really is one and one thing only that it's truly up to us. And that's our judgment. Consider judgments. So if I arrive at a decision, I consider a situation, you know, how, how am I going to act in this, in this particular situation? That's the result of my judgment. And my judgments lead me to either act in a certain way or not to act. And that's pretty much it. For Epictetus, everything else, meaning the outcomes of my action, are not up to me because they depend on other people, uh, they depend on external circumstances, and things like that. Now, let me give you a, a specific example. I came in here this morning and I told you that I was going to he be here around noon, right? Well, I don't live nearby, I live in Brooklyn. So that means uh, walking to the subway, getting the, taking on the subway, uh, exiting at uh, Penn Station, come here. Now, my intention, my judgment was that I could be here on time by noon if I left with plenty of time, you know, let's say 45 minutes earlier. So, great. That's my intention. That is up to me because that's my judgment. On the basis of what I know about New York and Brooklyn and subways and all that, that that's my judgment. However, of course, 
subways being subways, it could have been the case that I got there perfectly on time with plenty of time to spare. And then the subway stops in the middle of the tracks because maybe there is an accident, because maybe somebody fell ill and the police has to come in and all that sort of stuff. And all of a sudden I, I would have been half an hour late. Yeah. That's the outcome. So as you can see, the judgment, the decision to do things in a certain way and act on those judgments is up to me. But you would have been perfectly under, under, uh, understanding, I would hope, if I told you at some point, look, I'm going to be half an hour late because the subways are not working. If I told you I'm going to be half an hour late because I was lazy this morning and I got up late, then you probably would have gotten upset. He's like, what, the, what kind of guy is this? <laughs> you know, he doesn't, he doesn't really have a good judgment about how to do things. Yeah. But if the, result, if the delay is a result of something that is outside of my control, to go back to the notion that this is sometimes called the, the dichotomy of control, then I am not responsible for it. In other words, it's not up to me. It's up to other people. Now, once you get this fundamental distinction between the dichotomy, the, between, sorry, the, uh, what is up to you and what is not up to you, it can literally be applied to anything. Job interview. Same thing. Mm -hmm. What's up to me is to prepare for the interview, to go to bed early so that I get a night, good night of sleep, to, to make sure that I get there plenty of time and, and leave the house uh, in order to, to get to the interview, to focus uh, with uh, during the interview about what the interviewer is asking me. But actually getting the job, it's not up to me. Yeah. Right. It, I influence the outcome by way of my judgments. Mm -hmm. But the outcome is ultimately not, not up to me. And as a stoic, I'm ready, I'm prepared to say, look, sometimes you get your jobs and sometimes you don't get the job. And I have to be okay with it. I don't need to be upset. I don't need to be angry or anything like that. The third issue that you brought up is this uh, deliciously oxymoronic phrase that the stoics have, preferred or dispreferred indifference. Yeah. What does that mean? I mean, like, how can something be preferred and yet indifferent. It's like, this seems like a contradiction, right? Mm -hmm. um, what they're talking about is external things. That is things that are not the result of my judgment. For instance, getting a job. If I interview, I'm interviewing for a job. It is a preferred outcome, obviously, that I do get the job. It is dispreferred if I don't get the job. But either outcome is indifferent to what? To my moral character. It doesn't make, would I get the job or not, it doesn't make me a better person or a worse person. And for the Stoics, that's all that matters. Are you trying to be a good person or not? Yeah. So your character is the fundamental thing that defines you. And therefore, anything that does not affect your character is indifferent. Meaning, not that you don't care. I want the job, right? It has, it has value. I want to pay my bills and, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, but because it does not change my character, because it does not affect my character, then I can approach the, the outcome with equanimity and say, again, sometimes you get the job, sometimes you don't. Preferred indifference is a great point to actually expand a bit further. And I definitely want to expand on some other points you mentioned about nature and which aspects of nature we need to pick on and about agency as well. So we'll cover all of those. Let's start by talking about preferred indifference. I had mentioned the other philosophical schools of thought earlier as well. So let's bring them back into the picture. How would you compare the three? Because preferred indifference is one area where there is a difference between Stoicism and the teachings of Aristotle. So if you had to create the pros and cons of each, how would you compare Stoicism versus Aristotle versus Epicureanism? Oh, that's a great question. So let's start with Aristotle. Aristotelianism is actually very close to Stoicism. The Stoics and Aristotle agreed on a lot of things, unlike the Epicureans, which are very different, and I'll get to those in a moment. Yeah. For Aristotle, also, the two important things in life are virtue, meaning your character, yeah. meaning how, to, yeah, how you behave. That, in fact, is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, Aristotle agrees with the Stoics. However, Aristotle goes on and says, yeah, but so-called externals, things like health, education, uh, you know, wealth, even good looks yeah. are important. Not only they have value, they're, they're valuable, so they're preferred, as the Stoics would say. They really are important. If you don't have them, your life is going to suck. It's not an indifferent. That's right. They're not yeah. indifferent. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, they, are, they are very much making, they very much make a difference to the quality of your life. And therefore, Aristotle says, look, uh, not only you need to be a virtuous person, you know, you need to work on your character, become a better person. You also need at least some 
of that other stuff. Good looks, wealth, health, etc. The problem is that this makes Aristotelianism into a rather elitist philosophy because it cuts out a lot of people. <laughs> uh, you know, oh, you need to be good looking. Oh, well, too bad. If I'm not good looking, then I don't, I'm not going to have a good life. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you need to be, a, uh, you know, wealthy. Well, how much wealth is it is yeah. necessary? Uh, you need to be educated. What how much education are we talking about, et cetera, et cetera. So Aristotelian tends to be a philosophy for the elite, which is not surprising because Aristotle himself was in fact an aristocrat. Uh, his father was the personal physician of the king of Macedon. So, you know, he, he was up there. He, he really did have all of those things. So naturally he thought, well, if you don't have them, you're screwed. Yeah. The Stoics, the Stoic approach is uh, more democratic in a sense because the Stoics would say, yes, of course, your life is going to be better if you have some or all of those things. No question there. That's why they're preferred. However, even if you don't have any of those things, even if you're poor, not attractive, not wealthy, and even not educated, you can still have a life worth living so long as you're a good person. Mm -hmm. And that resonated with me because when I was growing up, for instance, uh, you know, I grew up with my grandparents. Uh, my grandfather, who was actually my adoptive grandfather, we were not related uh, by blood or by descent, he was that kind of person. He was a very nice and good person. He was a very ethical person. But, you know, he was not particularly attractive. He didn't have money. His health was, you know, okay, but not, nothing exceptional. His education was limited. And yet his life was very much worth living. He did a lot of good for other people, including myself. And so that is one of the things that, in my mind, makes uh, Stoicism more attractive than Aristotelianism. Now, let's get to Epicureanism. Yeah. Now, Epicureanism is an interesting philosophy because it's very different from, uh, from the premises of both Aristotle, Aristotle and the Stoics. For the Epicureans, virtue, meaning acting nicely toward other people, etc., is instrumental to having a good life. So the difference there being that for the Stoics, all you need is to be a nice person. And then you're going to be looking back at your life and say that was worth done, even though other things may not have gone your way. For the Epicurean, uh, being nice to other people is a way to get something out of other people, in other words. So if you want friends, you better be nice to your friends. Otherwise, you're not going to have friends. Okay. Uh, if you want good relationships at you know, in your job, then you better be nice to, to those people. Otherwise, you're not going to have good relationships. So uh, being nice, being virtuous, being pro-social is actually instrumental. It's in the service of getting something, of getting a, a, a favor, basically, from other people. The fundamental thing that uh, Epicureans think it's important is to live a life of pleasure. And the highest pleasure that they think is available to us is actually kind of an odd one, it's lack of pain. Epicurus thought that the highest possible pleasure and therefore the goal of a human life is no pain. Yeah. Not just physical pain, but, but mental, emotional pain. That meant a couple of things. For instance, the Epicureans suggested that we should never get involved in politics or social affairs because those are painful. Yeah. Right? It's like, why <laughs> yeah. would you want to do that? Yeah. And that's a major difference with both the Stoics and Aristotle. Both the Stoics and Aristotle thought that on, on the contrary, becoming politically involved, by which, by the way, I don't mean partisan. I don't mean, you know, going to the Democrats or the Republicans. I mean, politically involved. The, the word politics comes from polis, which means society in Greek, right? So it could take all sorts of forms, volunteering for a local organization that does something good, that's politics from the point of view of the Greco-Romans. Uh, you know, certainly engaging in political activity in terms of supporting a candidate or, or even be a candidate yourself definitely counts, but it's not the only way to do it. And so a major difference between the Stoics and the Aristotel Aristotelians on one hand and the Epicureans is for the first two, political involvement is a must. You cannot be a good member of society unless you care about society and you try to do whatever it is that you can do. You don't have to go all the way to becoming president of the United States, but whatever you can do. And for the Epicurean, Epicurus, on the other hand, it's exactly the opposite. Stay away as much as possible from that sort of stuff. Sure enough, the Epicureans uh, tended to live in what we would today call communes. They call them gardens, uh, uh, named after the original 
one by uh, established by Epicurus. And th- basically these were self-contained communities with a few people who knew each other, were friends of each other, and they would live their life on their own. Ironically, uh, after the collapse of the Roman Empire and the, the closing of all of these uh, Greco-Roman schools, those commu- most of those communes were taken over by Christians and they became monasteries. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. Which is, and in fact, sure enough, a, a Christian monastery is not really that different yeah. from an Epicurean garden because what you have is a bunch of people who are isolate, isolate themselves from the rest of the world. They live in an, in an enclave and they try to be self-sufficient. Fantastic comparison. Thank you for sharing that. Clearly lays out the differences in the principles between Stoicism, Aristotelian and Epicurean philosophies. Let's talk about so we've spoken about the definitions. We've got the theory. Let's talk about some of the practical implementation of Stoicism. And you've mentioned in the beginning as well that a lot of these practices have now been adopted by cognitive behavior therapy as well. What are some easy routines, habits, exercises that people can incorporate into their daily lives that will help them practice Stoicism and hopefully improve their lives? There are a lot. I actually wrote, uh, co-wrote a book with my friend Greg uh, Lopez entitled The Handbook for New Stoics that actually details a lot of these techniques that are useful f- depending on what you think you need to improve. Uh, for instance, let's say you have, you know, maybe you recognize that you have an anger management issue, then there are some exercise, stoic exercise you can do to, for, for that. But the two that I find most useful are one, one deals with the fundamental rule that we just discussed. And the other one is called philosophical journaling. So the fundamental rule, uh, every time that I face a difficult situation, a potential setback or a challenge of any kind, I either mentally, if I don't have the time to do it in writing or in writing, I can sit down and, and put it on a piece of paper. I prepare a simple table with two columns. What here and now is up to me on the left column and what is not up to me. So. One of the last times that I used this technique was I went to the airport and the flight was canceled, right? So, of course, people react in all sorts of different ways. Some people get upset and angry. Some people start shouting at the, the person behind the desk as if it was their fault or and as if shouting somehow makes a new plane appear out <laughs> of the blue, you know, that sort of stuff. Yeah. So as a stoic, what do you do? You, you sit down for a minute, you put up a you know pen and paper or you do it on your tablet. Or as I said, if you don't have... Uh, that, that kind of thing available, you can just do it mentally. And you say, okay, what's up to me and what is not up to me? And in the particular case that I'm talking about, uh, it turns out it's like, well, what's up to me here is to use the app for the, for the airline of the airline that I just canceled the, uh, the flight and rebook myself. That's the first thing to do. That, that's up to me. It's, it's, it's right there. It's possible. And sure enough, that's the first thing I, I did. What else is up to me? Well, once this is secured, um, I'm going to have now three hours at the airport. Yeah. So what's up to me is to catch up with some work or pull out a book that I was reading and or head to the bar and have a conversation with uh, my wife uh, who was traveling with me, that sort of stuff. Those are all up to me. What is not up to me? Uh, change the, sca- the schedule of the airline. That's not up to me. Uh, fix the problem somehow. That's not up to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, arrive at the original destination in uh, in time. That's not up to me either. So all of those things are not up to me. And once you have this list in front of you, it does two things. First, because you focus your attention on the on the first column, the left column, the things that are up to you. Now you have agency. One of the things that frustrates people uh, when there is a fit a, a setback or a challenge especially an unexpected one, is that they feel powerless. And if you feel powerless, you get upset, you get angry, you start shouting, you like get anxious, whatever it is. But by making that list, now you, immediately you have three, four, five things that actually you can do. And doing things to improve or solve the problem immediately makes you feel better. Yeah. The list on the right is all the stuff that I just need to get out of my mind. At this point, once it's on the list, I don't care anymore. Uh, I had an appointment and I, I was scheduled to deliver a lecture. Well, it's not up to me now to deliver the lecture on time. It is up to me to notify the person yeah. if I can, right? But it's not up to me, so I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to, and, and if I see that my mind is going in that direction and begins to be anxious or worried or something like that, 
I go back to the list and I say, wait, that, that thing is not up to me. And therefore it really is none of my concern. Not in the sense that I don't care. I don't give a crap about, about it, but in the sense that I cannot do anything about it. So why waste my time, mental energy, emotional resources on that sort of stuff? Now, of course, when you start doing it early on, you know, initially when you start practicing, this is easier said than done. Yeah. I mean, the technique is pretty simple, but the effects are not quite that immediate. You know, you still do get a little bit upset. You still do get, you know, a little bit worried, but the more you do it, it's like, like everything else we practice. The more you practice, the more you do it, the easier it actually uh, gets. The second technique that I find very useful, and I do it actually pretty much every day, is sometimes it's referred to as philosophical journaling or simply journaling. It's a little bit like keeping a diary, but there are some major differences. First of all, uh, I usually do it in the evening before going to bed. It takes like, you know, five minutes. It's not a, not a big deal. I open my laptop or my, or my tablet and um, I say, okay, what happened today that was challenging or that might have gone better if I had acted otherwise? And I pick one or two episodes during my day. So it's, for instance, probably tonight you're going to be in my, in my journal, yes. right? <laughs> because they're going to say, okay, well, there was... Hopefully positive. <laughs> hopefully positive, but yeah. it's going to be, well, that's a challenge because uh, you want to do a good interview. You want to have a good conversation. You want to be helpful to people that are going to be watching and listening to this, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a challenge. Yeah. And tonight I will ask myself, okay, so first of all, how did, how did it go? Did you do things in the best way possible? If so, great, excellent. If not, what did you do wrong? And why do you think you went wrong on this or that or the other? The point is not to regret or to relive the situation emotionally. It's simply to analytically go through it and try to learn from your own mistakes yeah as well as from your own successes. Oh, that worked very well. So I'm going to, why? Because I want to be ready for the next time. Yep. Uh, this kind of thing is going to happen again. Uh, in our life, situations repeat. Mm -hmm. So maybe today uh, you got upset with your partner and, you know, because whatever it is, something happened. Well, that might happen again. And so it's good for you to go over for a few minutes what happened, how you reacted, and most importantly, how you could have handled the situation better because the next time that way you're mentally prepared. There are a couple of tricks on, on doing this. First of all, don't be exhaustive. This is not a diary where you put down, you know, today I ate for lunch, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's only you focus on one or two episodes that are challenging or, or ethically salient. Number two, you use analytical language, not emotional language, because the point is not to relive the whole thing emotionally. The point is to learn from it. So you need to be detached. And number three, uh, and modern cognitive behavioral therapists would agree with, with this suggestion. You write in the second person as if you were writing to a friend. So you say, oh, you today did this. Like Marcus and, Aurelius. Yeah, yeah, like Marcus Aurelius, yeah. exactly, in the yeah. meditations. Well, there is good evidence that what that does good modern evidence, scientific evidence, that what that does is, again, it helps you detach yourself emotionally. Uh, if you're writing as if you were writing to a friend, you presume you're not going to upset with the friend because you're trying to help the friend. You're yeah. trying to be, you know, constructive. You're not going to, you're not going to yell at the friend, but you might yell at yourself. Yeah. And so when you initially feels a little awkward, I have to say, you know, when I started doing this several years ago, it's like, wait a minute, that, that feels really strange. You're talking to yourself. <laughs> yeah, talking to yourself in the yeah. second person, like, what the hell? <laughs> um, but it actually does help. And the more you do it, uh, as I said, I do it pretty much every day. You don't need to be that, uh, that, that constant in, in the exercise. But what that does, among other things, over the long run, it creates a record of your challenges, your setbacks, how you dealt with it. If you do it electronically, like on a, on a, a computer, then you become searchable. And so you can find patterns about your own behavior. It's like, okay, well, how many times the word anger, let's say, shows up in this thing? Oh, it turns out early on, it shows up several times, but recently uh, it doesn't. So perhaps if I had an anger issue, then that actually has, has improved, that yeah. sort of thing. Fantastic. It reminds me of this open mic technique that a lot of stand-up comics take, where they go and try a certain material, and then they keep the... Like they keep the good parts and they try to analyze what didn't work. How did yep. the crowd react and like try to fix that. And these incremental changes end up making a great set. It's a fantastic exercise. The first one that you mentioned about 
things that you can control, what's in your control, what's not. We also spoke about the fundamental rule, the dichotomy of control. Let's talk about it. In your book, you say that it is also true that the Stoics turned out to be overly optimistic about how much control human beings have over their own thoughts. Nietzsche had coined the phrase amor fati, love your fate. Let's get your take on this. Where do you stand on free will and agency? You brought it up as well that the only thing that is in our control is our judgment. So I want to expand that even further. What is really in our control? Can you even go as far as saying that maybe even judgment is not in our control because that could be just a result of some neurological impulse that we're just reacting on? Do you think we have any agency or is everything cause and effect deterministic determined? Right. That is a good question. So the Stoics, I think, have had, the ancient Stoics, a very reasonable notion uh, of cause and effect. So they thought that the universe is made of matter, that everything that has causal powers is made of stuff. It's made of things. And, and that everything has, uh, belongs to a sort of a, a broad web of cause and effect. Nothing happens unless it's caused by something else. No miracles, no no supernatural, nothing. I mean, they believed in a God, but the God turned out to be nature itself. So it's like, you know, uh, Einstein's God, as you had it, had it here, right? So that means that, now that, seem, that would seem to suggest that the Stoics don't believe in free will. In fact, they didn't. If by free, you mean not causally connected with the rest of the universe. No, there is no such a thing as free will in that sense. Okay. But there is a will. We do make decisions. Uh, modern psychologists don't use usually the word free will. They use the word volition, hmm. which is, interestingly is in fact the same word that the Stoics used. Uh, Epictetus used prohiresis, which means literally volition, the yeah. ability to make decisions. In a sense, uh, one good way to think about it is that we are, we evolved as highly sophisticated decision-making machines. When I said that our evolutionary weapon is our brain, and it allow, which, is, well, which allows us to make decisions, to arrive at judgments, and then to act or not to act on those judgments. That's pretty much what we are. So when the Stoics said, okay, everything is cause and effect, they also realized, let me step back there for a second. These days in contemporary philosophy, uh, especially some popular authors like um, Sam Harris, for instance, yeah. Would say, oh, there is no free will, and they and they bring up this image of us as sort of uh, puppets, puppets, right? That are the, our strings are moved That's by it. the forces of the universe, right? Yep. Well, the Stoics would look at that and said, no, it does. There, there are no strings because the ca the causal powers of the world not only are externals, they're also internal. I mean, it's not like we are inert in, internally. We are actually making decisions all the time. We're analyzing data from our, our, from our senses and our brain is making decisions all the time. The web of cause and effect doesn't stop outside of us. It goes through us. So when we make a decision, it is both the result of external forces, for sure, but also the result of internal processing of internal mechanisms. And one of the things that they emphasized is that External forces are whatever they are, right? I um, mean, they, they, they're, they're not up to you. They're, yeah. they're definitely not under your control. But the internal forces, the internal decision-making mechanism actually can be improved over time. Because you get, we get better, you know, growing up means, in, among other things, becoming better and better at making decisions. Maturing emotionally means exactly that, that you're making, you're becoming better and better at making decisions. When we say, oh, that person is wise, right? Because they have lived a long time and they have learned from their experiences. Because living, just living a long time doesn't make you wise. It, just, it, it probably makes you cranky, but not wise. What makes you wise is having a lot of experience, but also being able to process that experience and learn from that experience and put that, what you learned, into, into practice. Well, all of that means you're getting better and better and making decisions. So... When we say that some things are up to us, what really the Stoics mean, mean is that us is the internal machinery that we have, mostly the brain, although not entirely. Uh, we, today we understand, unlike the Stoics, for instance, uh, modern science understands that cognition is embodied. It's not just the brain. Um, our nervous system goes everywhere and we make decisions 
by using the entirety of our uh, nervous system, not just the brain. Although the yeah. brain is a big part. It's, it's the big, and especially the frontoparietal lobes of our brain. That's where modern scientists will tell you our executive function is, resides. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, the Stoics also talked about an executive function. They call it the hegemonicon in Greek, which me literally means the ruling faculty. So what they thought was that, look, not everything we think is actually consciously deliberate, conscious and deliberate. It's not up to us. I can have all sorts of autonom what we would call today autonomic thoughts. Stuff comes in to my mind and then goes out the other way. And, you know, I often I'm not even aware of a lot of these things. Uh, a lot of our reactions are uh, automatic and we don't really have control. For instance, if you come close to me and you just flick your, your finger near my eyes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blink. I cannot not blink. It's just, it's an automatic reaction. It's just, that's going to happen. Or if you say something that I find embarrassing, I'm going to blush. And Seneca, one of the ancient Stoics said, you have no control over that. Don't worry. It's not up to you. This is, this is, it is a result of mental, uh, you know, functioning, but it's not really up to you. However, if you ask me, you know, Massimo, would you be available uh, next Monday at noon for an interview? That is something that is up to me in the specific sense, not that I have free will and I'm somehow independent of the rest of causality in the universe, but that my internal decision-making machine says, looks at the calendar and says, yes, I am. I, I'll be there at noon on Monday. Importantly, if I'm not here at noon on Monday, you will think that I'm responsible for it. You will not say, oh, well, the causality of the universe uh, has gotten in the way of doing the interview and too bad. You actually will call me up, possibly upset and say, hey, where the hell are you? Right. I am responsible in that sense. Even people like Sam Harris, who make a big show of these, these you know, puppets and strings kind of stuff. They are proud of what they're doing. He's, he's happy about being an, a successful author and podcaster, et cetera. They're probably ashamed of some things that I've done. I don't know him personally, so I don't know what he might be ashamed of. But, you know, we all, we all do. And the Stoics want to say, of course, because some of those things are the result of your internal machinery. And so you are responsible in that specific sense, not in any metaphysical uh, sort of bizarre, uh, you know, fashion, but just in the sense that, those were your decisions. And so you are responsible uh, in the sense that those came from you. They came from your internal machinery. And who else am I going to, I'm going to hold responsible for it. Yeah. Very interesting perspective. And yeah, very different from Sam Harris's idea of the system, which has got this external influences. Your the perspective where you laid out is more like a control systems and an engineering term where there's a feedback loop and it's all part of the same system. So in a sense, if you think about it, I mean, maybe maybe some some of your listeners or viewers might not like the analogy, but I think it's accurate. We're kind of a very sophisticated AI system, except that it's not artificial. It's natural. It's a natural intelligent system, uh, and that's what natural intel what intelligent systems do. Not only they make decisions, sometimes complex, sophisticated decisions, but they're capable of learning from their experiences and making future decisions even better. So that's what we are. We're naturally intelligent systems. I completely agree. And it's up to you how you define the objective function and then how do you keep mm -hmm. relearning. Thank you for that fantastic answer. Let's check one more aspect from your book. In your book, How to Be a Stoic, you say that Aristotle made a crucial distinction between moral virtue and intellectual virtue. The former arising from both natural disposition and habit acquired while growing up and the latter resulting from reflection in a mature mind. How does nature versus nurture work with philosophy? You mentioned something earlier about how, about your grandfather as well. And maybe the fact that you might've been bullied in school as well, that, that maybe pushed you towards a certain philosophy, uh, preferred indifference, what you can control, what you can't control, health, wealth, things like that. Um, do you think some people are more naturally predisposed to a certain philosophy or stoicism? They have a certain personality or something that happened when they are bringing that made that pushes them towards that direction. Do you think any philosophy can be acquired? Mm. Very, very good question. So as a biologist, actually, my interest has always been on nature and nurture. That's what I did my research on. Yeah. And the answer to nature and nurture questions, I think it's safe to say that it is a complicated and B it's always a Intricate combination of both. both. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't, you really cannot separate. Yeah. Here's an analogy, which I, it's not original with me. I didn't make it, make it up, but um, a 
very good colleague and friend of mine who died recently did, Richard Lewontin, who was a uh, very influential geneticist at Harvard. And he said, he tried to explain that how nature and nurture put together basically organisms. And he said, look, uh, if you're building a house with bricks and lime, right? What are you going to do? Well, you have to lay the bricks and then the lime and then the bricks and then the lime in a specific pattern. You can't just throw in a bunch of bricks and a bunch of lime and, and have the house. Yeah. Now, once the house is done, so it's about the interaction between the lime and the, brick, the bricks. Now, once the, uh, uh, the house is done, you could, if you wanted to, ask the question, well, but what percentage of the house is the result of bricks? And what percentage is the result of lime? And you will find out that it's, for, of course, mostly bricks because the bricks are heavier than the, than the lime. But that doesn't tell you anything because it's not about putting lime and bricks together. It's about the specific pattern. The same goes for genes and environment. You could say, oh, look, a particular characteristic, let's say human intelligence is the result, you know, 60% is the result of the gene and 40% of the environment. Sounds like you're saying something meaningful, but you're not. Because what really happened was that genes and environments kept interacting in the same, in fact, in a much more complicated way than the way uh, that bricks and limes interact. So the answer is always, it's complicated and it's both. That said, there's pretty decent evidence, I think, from modern cognitive science that our character, which is what the Stoics were concerned with, in fact, what the Greco-Romans in general were concerned with, right? Our character means our behavioral propensities. So if I say, uh, you know, uh, my friend is a very generous person, what do I mean? I mean that other things being equal, she tends to act generously. So to devote time or energy or money, et cetera, to other people, right? Yeah. That's what it means. So it's part of her character. And what that means is that other things being equal, she has a behavioral tendency to do things in a certain way rather than in another, in another way. Yeah. Now, the, the, the goal of all of the Greco-Roman philosophy and philosophies and Stoicism in particular to improve our character. However, even the Stoics were well aware that some people are naturally more generous than others. Some people are naturally more temperate than others. Some people are naturally more courageous than others, etc. And modern cognitive science supports that. The numbers don't really matter. I think the latest estimate that I've heard is that about 40 to 50 percent of the variation in our character seems to be statistically correlated with genes. But as I said, keep in mind the the lime and bricks metaphor, that number doesn't really mean that much. Not, not as much as it sounds. It, it's, it's a number, so we think that we're being precise, but not really. But that means, th what, it, what it does mean is that part of our character is in fact pretty much fixed, uh, or at least is within certain very specific boundaries, kept within boundaries by our genetic makeup. And of course, we have absolutely no control over our genetic makeup, right? Yeah. That is definitely not something that is up to us. However, what that also means is that a lot of the variation among people's characters is the result of upbringing, uh, mindful efforts to improve on one's own, et cetera, et cetera. Here's an analogy right, that maybe, maybe help. Pretty much everybody can learn to play a musical instrument with very few exceptions. I mean, if you're really tone deaf, well, then, you know, then, you, then you're out of luck. But with very few exceptions, Everybody can learn a musical instrument. But of course, very few people become Mozart or, or Beethoven or something like that. So there are some people who are naturally so gifted that they don't really need, need a lot of learning and a lot of practice. They'll just do it. Even those people would get better. You know, Mozart did, did training. He was trained uh, as, a, as a child. So even the geniuses do become better with training. But the point is, everybody becomes better with training, no matter where you start. So yeah, some of us might not be naturally temperate uh, or naturally courageous, but if you practice temperance and if you practice courage, you get better. Now, how do you practice temperance or courage? Well, let's say um, Musanus Rufus, who was one of the ancient Stoics, uh, said, oh, you can practice temperance at least three times a, a day, every time you sit down for a meal. How do you do that? Well, you mindfully think about what's about to happen and you remind yourself that you Need, you don't need to eat a lot. You don't need to grab things when they come your way. You need to focus on things that are nutritious and, 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 uh, and useful, et cetera, et cetera. Once you start doing that mindfully, you will get better and better and better. Whether you were naturally 
temperate or not. It will take time, just like learning a musical instrument or learning a language or going to the gym. Everything takes time, but it will, you will improve. You might not become a Mozart, but you will improve. How do you improve courage? Well, there are different kinds of courage out there. Courage for the Stoics is not something like, you know, going to battle and facing the enemy. Uh, it always has a moral component. So it's, it's the courage to do the right thing. So for instance, um, I don't know about you, but I tend to be embarrassed by talking to certain groups of people. For instance, homeless people, which New York has unfortunately a large number. But then I started remembering like, wait, wait a minute, those are people. And it's okay to, in fact, not only okay, it's a good idea to meet them eye to eye, to talk to them, to just say even good, good morning. Uh, whether you're going to give them something or not, that's a, that's a different, that's, that, that's, uh, that falls under, uh, you know, generosity or under uh, justice in a sense. Sure. But just in terms of courage, it really literally takes courage to do the right thing because we tend to be embarrassed or we tend to think, oh, oh my gosh, if, if, what's going to happen if I talk to this person? You know, maybe, maybe he's going to not like it. Maybe it's like yelling at me or something. No, it, Usually they don't, you know, there, there are people like everybody else and they do like be treated like people and it takes courage to do that. So initially you might make that decision mindfully and say, okay, from now on, that's what I'm going to do. And initially it's going to feel awkward. It's going to feel even painful and it's not going to come easier. But the more you do it day after day, after day, after week, after month, eventually it becomes second nature. You don't even think about it anymore. Great answer. So much to think about. I love the brick and lime metaphor as well and how simple things can come together with certain rules and create complexity. It's, it's always something that really, really fascinates me. I feel like we could keep exploring this and be here all day. So I'm <laughs> going to try and bring it back into the structure. Before we start winding down, we've spoken about stoicism at length. We explored so many different digressions. We spoke about its advantages, some of the routines. I think it's only fair that we also cover some of the criticisms of stoicism. Of course. We have established that one of the crucial premises of stoicism is that nature is fundamental. And in this case, we define nature as for human beings, at least being social animals and being capable of reason. You mentioned it earlier as well. What parts of nature are good because not everything about nature is good. How do we make that choice? Right. Let's talk about the appeal to nature argument. I have an example in architecture. This was this one field that over the last century, took the premise that nature is indeed fundamental and it spawned this theory of naturalism and this generation of architects known as naturalist architects. And they started basing their design standards and architectural styles on nature. Now modern architects are moving away from it completely and they have cited multiple reasons. The first being who gets to decide what aspects of nature are fundamental. Fair enough. And what's good for nature is not necessarily a good design standard or architectural style. There's also a lot of biases that are inherent in nature, like physical capacity, for example, or disabled people are not valued enough in nature. There's a certain kind of premium that it puts on them. And then there's also the reproduction of nature theory, which says that certain aspects of nature have been reproduced. So they're not really fundamental anymore, right? So let's talk about it. Maybe the reasons might be different, but is it possible to stretch that thread from architecture to philosophy only as far as saying that maybe the idea that nature is fundamental is wrong? And therefore using nature as the basis for our philosophical beliefs and actions could be false. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's certainly a good question. As I said, however, the Stoics do not make an appeal to nature, which is a logical fallacy. Yeah. Uh, and one of the reasons is that they were very good logicians. Uh, Chrysippus was one of the early Stoics in, in Athens, and he was actually one of the foremost logicians of antiquity. And he was very aware of that kind of, of, you know, fallacious reasoning. So they're not saying that, whatever is natural is therefore necessarily good. As I said before, there's plenty of counter examples. So it would be really silly if they built an entire philosophy on a notion that can, that a child can easily come up with a counter example, but what about mushrooms, you know, yeah. et cetera, poisonous mushrooms. Mm -hmm. But the, so the no, the notion that the really, the, the, the way to understand what the Stoics are saying is, is to ask, what is it that makes a human being flourishing? If you don't want to talk about nature, that's fine. But the question is what makes a human being flourishing? And their answer is, well, what does that is being pro-social and using reason, which happened to be what nature endows us with as, as fundamental characteristics for, for our species. If you move away from the notion that you need to get guidance from nature, 
then the only major alternative that is left is relativism. Your opinion, my opinion. Tomato, tomato, potato, potato, whatever. Yeah. And there are, in fact, a lot of moral relativists today. There were at the time, at the time, the, the moral relativists of the time were the sophists, the people that famously Socrates and Plato really couldn't stand. But there is a lot of moral relativists today. A lot of my students, surprisingly, uh, claim to be moral relativists. Like, oh, well, you know, what another culture does, it's its, its own thing. Who am I to criticize? Which sounds very nice until you start pointing out some obvious counterexamples. Say, seriously, so the Rwandan genocide, for instance, you're not going to criticize the people that engage in genocide. You're going to say that, well, that was their, their opinion. It's like, you know, I like chocolate. You like Manila. I don't like genocide, you like genocide, we're fine. And then when, when I put that to my student that way, it's like, wait, no, wait a minute. Oh, okay. So now you, that means you have a standard of some sort. Well, where does that come, that, that starting to come from? If you agree that certain things are in fact just or not just for human beings, they work or don't work, then where are you getting that standard? And the only answer that I can think of is nature. Well, there is another answer, God. But if you don't believe in God, then, it's the, then you're left with nature. And in fact, the Stoics really answered uh, both ways because they said God is nature. And therefore, <laughs> if you do things that are against human nature, you're actually being impious. You, you're, you're, you're actually, in a sense, rejecting uh, you know, the nature of God Spinoza's itself. Spinoza's God. Right, yeah. Spinoza's God. Right. So there is been, there's this long tradition in philosophy, even outside of the Stoics, of what is called natural law. Cicero, for instance, who was not a Stoic, was a major proponent of natural law. Thomas Aquinas, uh, that I mentioned earlier, one of the major, if not arguably the major Christian theologian of the Middle Ages, was in favor of natural law. And even today, when we have things like the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, yeah. that is based, if not explicitly, at least implicitly, on the notion of natural law. Meaning what? Meaning that there are some things that we recognize are naturally good for human beings and some things are naturally bad. It is naturally good for a human being to have access to food, shelter, uh, uh, water, you know, et cetera. And it's naturally bad for a human being not to have those things. That's why the United Nations says that access to food, water, and shelter are human rights. There are other things that they added on, and then we can have a discussion about whether all the rights that we recognize today are in fact natural or not. That would be, that will take a whole episode of your podcast. <laughs> um, yeah. But the notion, the fundamental notion is that there are some things that are in fact, we recognize to be naturally good or bad for human beings. And that's all that the Stoics meant by nature, by, by, by saying we should live according to nature. And we cannot do without it. Because if we do, then the only other two choices that we have are either God says so, but then we have to have a discussion about, well, which God and where did he say so, or anything goes, yeah. or, or things become completely arbitrary and, eh, well, you know, if I take your food and your water, too bad. I, I don't think we want to go there. Yeah, complete anarchy. Can I ask you to steel man some of the popular criticisms against stoicism? Can you step into the shoes of some of the critics? and present the arguments as they would have presented if they were here today. Yeah, the major two objections to Stoicism are that it's about going through life with a stiff upper lip. Yeah. And like that Spock. it, yes, <laughs> and it is about suppressing emotions. So in other words, Spock from Star Trek. One of my favorite characters <laughs> ever, but I agree, no, we don't want to live like Spock. It's yeah. not, not going to be a good idea for a human being to live like, like a Vulcan. So I think those are actually interesting objections, but they do stem uh, out of a confusion, I think, between what my colleague Don Robertson calls stoicism with a little s and stoicism with a big s. The big s stoicism is the philosophy that is actually practiced and, and put forth by the stoics. The little s stoicism is in fact that kind of attitude that we just described, the stiff upper lip, suppressing of emotion, stuff like that. And the two are not the same thing because the Stoics do not actually advocate suppressing emotions and they do not advocate a stiff upper lip. But you can see where the confusion comes from because there are Sto actual Stoic concepts that are superficially similar to the, to the caricature, to the, mis to the misguided view. For instance, the Stoics do not advocate a stiff upper lip, but they do advocate endurance. 
endurance is a stoic thing. When I said, when we were talking earlier about the fundamental rule of life, some things are up to me and other things are not up to me. I said that the correct stoic attitude toward things that are not up to me is acceptance. Yeah. Because what, what else can I do about it? If they're not up to me, I, you know, I can get upset, but what's the point of getting upset about things that I cannot change, right? Yeah. Well, that sounds a little bit like the stiff upper lip, except that it is in, in a sense, a joyous acceptance. Epictetus says, Amor fati, uh, which of course, as you pointed out, that's actually a phrase from Nietzsche, but Nietzsche was paraphrasing the Stoics at that yeah. point. It's like, embrace it. It's, it is what it is. You're not going to be able to change it. So you might as well, at the very least, accept it. Uh, you may not have to throw a party uh, at it, but you need to accept it because for the simple reason that you really don't have an alternative and yeah. getting upset about something that is inevitable doesn't seem to be particularly useful. So that's where the stiff upper lip comes from. The suppression of emotion, it's a little bit more complicated and interesting. The Stoics uh, theory of emotion is, is fascinating and it does go fairly well with some updates with uh, what we learned from modern cognitive science. Basically, the Stoics thought, look, there are two fundamental categories of emotions, unhealthy and healthy ones. Unhealthy emotions are things like anger, fear, hatred, stuff like that. Healthy emotions are joy, love, a sense of justice. They counted a sense of justice as an emotion. And they didn't say we should suppress emotions. But what they did say is we should try to use reason to move ourselves as far as possible from the unhealthy emotions and as much as possible toward the cultivation of the healthy emotions. Yep. Let me give you an analogy with food. Mm -hmm. There are some bad foods and there are some good foods for us. And I mean medically bad or good, right? Not as in taste. Like French fries taste very good, mm. but any doctor would tell you <laughs> they're not healthy, yeah. okay? It's an unhealthy food. Uh, broccoli might not taste particularly uh, good, but it is a healthy food. Mm -hmm. And so what basically the studies are saying is like, look, you thought that you're not going to eat all of a sudden. That would be the complete suppression of emotion. You're not eating. You can't do that. You have, you're a human being. You have to eat. You're a human being. You have emotions. You have to... To, to use those emotions in a, in a good way. However, your reason, and not ju just your basic instinct, your reason can tell you, well, as it turns out, this, the French fries are not really good for me. So maybe I'll have them once in a blue moon, but that's it. I'll, I'll enjoy them once in a while, but I'm going to try to stay away from it. And the broccoli is good for me, uh, you know, since it doesn't taste that good, maybe I'll put some tamari sauce on it and yeah. a little bit of salt and, and they're going to be okay. They're going to be fine. That's what the Stoics are trying to do by shifting essentially our natural emotional spectrum away from what they consider unhealthy and toward what they consider healthy. But you can see that if you misunderstand that and you simplify a little too much, then it turns out that... Uh, you know, the stereotype that they want to suppress emotions. Thank you for sharing that and representing your critics in, a, in an impartial manner. I think that's very <laughs> important. And I could, and maybe this is a conversation for part two, but like there is a case to be made about even the things that you can't control, having an emotional reaction to them. Does that make you more human? Does that give you more purpose? And even having the unhealthy reactions because emotions are such like the core of who we are. Like, is that something that's to be expected? Is that more natural than like just acceptance? But that's definitely a discussion that will take for another us, time. Yes. Yeah, for another time. <laughs> Before we move into final questions, I would love it if you can interpret what I've built with the Lego. What do you think these these masterpieces? Oh, that's interesting. This is a modernist uh, uh, building. Uh, <laughs> it's something that I could see, you know, in New York yeah. around us, in uh, Williamsburg, and, maybe. Yeah, that's right. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And this looks to me like some kind of animal uh, with only two front legs. Uh, and it doesn't have back legs. So it might be something that evolved from a snake or something like that. It's losing the the, the, the back legs. Maybe it is. This is dichotomy <laughs> of control, right? I can only control what I can make. Can't control the interpretation of it. Fantastic. Let's move into some of our final questions. What are some books, movies, role models that have strongly influenced you in your life? Books or movies? Oh, gosh, there's so much uh, out there uh, that it's amazing. I mean, I hate it when people say, oh, what's your favorite movie? Like, what do you mean? One, maybe, yeah, maybe so two dozens or something, <laughs> but definitely not one. So things that influence me uh, in terms of books, um, I tend to read a lot, of course, of philosophy and science. But there are a few books that really had a major impact on me. One was The Demon Hunted World by Carl Sagan. 
which came out a number of years ago. You know, Cal Sagan has been dead now for a few years. But I was a, a young teenager when I when I read it, and it really made an, an impression because it's a book about how to think uh, rationally through a bewildering universe, a universe that has all sorts of things that we don't understand. Uh, one of the most interesting parts of the book is where uh, Sagan develops what, what he calls the uh, baloney detector. Uh, it's, a, it's essentially the basics of critical thinking as we teach them today. And it's a basic set of tools that, you know, questions you want to ask yourself whenever you are uh, presented with a extraordinary claim, with a claim that, you know, somebody, oh, I saw somebody flying today. It's like, really? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> show, show me. What, what, how, does, how does that work? Yeah. So that book was definitely fundamental. Uh, Bertrand Russell's How to Be, uh, not, not to Be a Christian, uh, is Why I'm Not a Christian, is, uh, is also in interesting because that was the first time, again, I was a teenager actually when I read it the first time, that was the, the, my first encounter with a obviously bright person, a sophisticated thinker, who actually was rejecting what for the time, at the time for me, was a major part of my worldview. I, I grew up Catholic. So it's like, whoa, wait a minute. It, can you do this? <laughs> and then I, when I got over the initial shock, I, I read through the detail and I said, wow, this is really clever argument. Um, then I started wondering, well, I wonder what kind of counter arguments, you know, theologians have come up with. And that actually led me on a, several years of reading about this stuff un, until I felt that I could make up my mind. So those are two of the the books that influence me. In terms of movies, um, I do watch a lot of fiction because I just, you know, I enjoy relaxing and all that. Um, but in terms of influence, one of the, the things that I watched over the last few years that really had a major impact on me is a documentary. And it's called Young Plato. This is a documentary set in a uh, Catholic high school, uh, sorry, Catholic elementary school in uh, Belfast, in Northern, in, in Northern Ireland. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a difficult area of the world where there's still conflict between Catholics and Protestants. And the protagonists are these kids who have to deal with all sorts of issues from bullying in the, in the, in the schoolyard to their parents telling them that they need to hit back because that's the nature of the world, that, that sort of stuff. And the documentary is about the principal of that school who starts teaching practical philosophy to the kids. And he starts teaching them about Socrates and about Buddha and about the Stoics and all that. And you can see the lives of these children changing day by day, week by week, because they're empowered with this sudden notion that, wait a minute, I can think my way through certain problems. I don't have to accept what other people necessarily tell me. I can start thinking through things. I can test out different patterns of behavior and, and see what happens. So I highly recommend it. I think it was, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great movie. Sounds fantastic. I look forward to watching it. Epictetus once said that I must die. Must I? If at once, then I'm dying. If soon, I dine now. That is this time for dinner. And afterwards, when the time comes, I will die. There's a Latin phrase, memento mori. Mm -hmm. Remember, you will die. How do you view death and mortality? And do you think it's important to constantly remind ourselves that we are all one day going to die? Yeah, that, that phrase by Epictetus was one of the first things that turned me into, uh, into stoicism. Because first of all, notice the sense of humor. Oh, if yeah. I have to die now, fine. <laughs> if, but if not, I'm going to out for dinner. You know, I'll, do, I'll, I'll think later about, about dying. So I like that kind of approach. No, no nonsense. Uh, tinged with a little bit of, of humor. But yeah, I think that that attitude is basically right. And this is one of those rare cases actually where the Stoics and the Epicureans did agree. Epicurus famously said that, uh, why, why are you worried about dying, uh, you know, about death, where death is, you are not, and I where you are, here. yeah, and where yeah. you are, yeah. she's not. <laughs> I'm just going to read it out. Yeah. Death, therefore, the most awful of evils is nothing to us, seeing that when we are, death is not come. And when death has come, we are not. Right. So <laughs> Simple it, equation. If you exactly. <laughs> so he was saying, look, um, being dead means that you're not going to have any experiences. There is no you there anymore. So that's what it means to, to die. So why are you worried about what happens after death? There's, yeah. there's nobody there that is going to actually experience anything. Therefore, don't worry about it. Now, the Stoics turned that around. Uh, the Stoics were very... Uh, they, they, they give a lot, gave a lot of thought to, to the, the issue of death, not just Epictetus, but also Seneca, for instance. And 
But what they did was they turned around and said, look, be, since death is something you don't really need to worry about for the same reasons that the Epicureans uh, put forth, then shouldn't you be worried about what you're doing right here, right now? That's why Epictetus says, you know, oh, it's time for dinner. So let's, let me go have dinner, right? In other words, it turns the issue of death into a appreciation of life in a sense. Like, well, I know I have to die at some point, And when that point comes, I'll deal with it. I'll, I will prepare myself mentally for that, for that point. But right now I have a life to live. Uh, the, the ancient Romans put it in terms of hic et nunc, which means here and now. You need to pay attention here and now. I'm not going to worry about death. I'm talking to you and I'm enjoying this conversation. Uh, this afternoon, presumably the situation is going to be the same. My death isn't going to be that much closer. So I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to do, you know, uh, something else. I'm going to call a friend, et cetera, et cetera. And then when it's time to deal with it, you'll deal with it just like you deal with everything else in life. It is true that the Stoics did think that death, you know, the process of dying really is the most important test of our character in a sense, because it is a big one. Uh, society tells us it's a big one. We're, we all, you know, we're talk there's a lot of resources and energy and, and writings and talking that goes into thinking about that. But from the Stoic perspective, it's like, okay, that is just one more thing that is going to happen in your life. You are guaranteed that it's going to happen at some point. And more importantly, you don't know when. We, we all make this mistake, I think, which is psychologically reassuring, of thinking in statistical terms. So for instance, in my case, you know, I'm 59. Statistically speaking, as a white male who lives in the United States, I have a life expectancy into my late 70s. So I tend to think like everybody else would, oh, okay, I got, a, I got some time. I don't know. I could go across the street in half an hour and be hit by a bus and that would be it. Or I could live well into my 80s or 90s. I have no idea. And why should I worry about it? It's going to happen when it's going to happen. And there's nothing else I can do about it. That's all it. <laughs> no fear of that. <laughs> that was easy. Last two questions. Mark Twain once said that two important days in every man's life, the day he was born and the day he finds out why he was born. What would you like your legacy to be? That's interesting. Uh, the Stoics really don't care about legacy yeah. because uh, Marcus Aurelius, who was a, you know, emperor as well as a philosopher, he says several times in the meditations, like, uh, why are you worried about what people are going to think after you're dead? You don't know those people. Uh, you're not going to know what they're going to think about it. So what is the problem here? Just try to do what you think is the right thing again, right here and right now, and then let the chips fall where they may. And so I'm really not worried about my legacy. I'm worried about trying to do the right thing for my friends, for my wife, for my daughter, for society at large as it is. And then, you know, very likely we're all going to be forgotten at some point. I mean, the irony, of course, is that Marcus Aurelius did say several times in the meditations, you know, you're going to be forgotten very soon. And he was he not. Right? Yeah. <laughs> 2000 years later, we're still talking about it. Exactly. But eventually it will. Yeah. Eventually, nobody will read the meditations. Eventually, there might not be a human race in the first place. And so at some point, you know, eventually, certainly there's not going to be a universe anymore. So who cares? I mean, when, uh, when I'm dead, there's, there's not going to be any more me to worry about what the reputation is. In fact, I try to be, as a stoic, I try not to be worried about my reputation even now. Because you cannot please everybody and you cannot second guess every, everybody. So you just need to do what you think is right make sure that you do your utmost to actually know what the right thing is, because, you know, we can fool ourselves, we can rationalize our actions, we can do all sorts of things that are not quite, quite good. So you ask your friends, you ask your colleagues, you know, am I doing the right thing? You ask for feedback, you try to, to do things in the best way that you can, and that's it. Then whatever, people will think good things or bad things. One of the reasons I left social media uh, entirely, for instance, is precisely because I really don't care how many likes or dislikes I get uh, when I tweet or when I post on Facebook. It's like, what is that to me? Very ironic that by not focusing on building a legacy, Marcus Aurelius left behind such a legacy. And I feel yeah. you're on the same path with the kind of books that you have written in the interviews and your lectures. It's definitely a rich legacy. And by teaching people not to focus <laughs> on a legacy, you're definitely helping a lot of people and would be remembered for years. 
final question. Albert Camus had once said that I see many people die because they judge that life is not worth living. I see others paradoxically getting killed for the ideas or illusions that give them a reason for living. What is called a reason for living is also an excellent reason for dying. I therefore conclude that the meaning of life is the most urgent of questions. Over the last hour, we've been flirting around this one big question, this word that's been over our heads, this elephant in the room. And I feel like we have partially answered it, but I do want to explicitly tackle it one final time head first. What is the meaning of life? Massimo Pagliucci. I think the best answer that I heard to that question was by uh, Gary Zankiller, the entertainer who used to work for National Public Radio. He used to have a sound off uh, in his midday show that said, um, if I remember correctly, do good, be good, and keep in touch. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Uh, that is, we are so, again, we're social animals. So do good, right? Be good, which is really the same thing uh, in, in, at the end of the day, because you do good because you are good or you're trying to be good. And keep in touch, meaning that you have social relations and people care about, you know, they're, they're, I have friends, for instance, I have a friend right now uh, who's just went through an operation and it was a minor thing, but she does suffer from a little bit of anxiety. So just keep in touch with her, just text her or call her up and say, Hey, how you doing? So do good, be good, keep in touch. I love it. Easy. <laughs> nice. Remember, do good, be good, keep in touch. Perfect. Professor, thank you so much. If people want to connect with you online in person, get one of your books, how can they do so? MassimoPilucci.org is where I have all of my stuff. And I also publish a newsletter on Substack called Figs in Winter. Sounds great. That's the place to find you. Professor, thank you so much. It was a privilege talking to you. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me.